um, I've met quite a few of you over the past two days, but for those who haven't met me yet, I'm a, I'm a six-year PhD student at Stanford in the computer science department. And uh, my research interest throughout my PhD has been building tools, automated tools, to help scientists in their workflow. And um, one tool I'm going to present today is called CD. Actually, Juliana, thank you for giving, the <laughs> giving a, a shout out to CD actually earlier in her talk. Um, it used to be called CD Pack, and I just shortened the name. Sorry. It's the same thing. It's fine. It, you know, by the time when you probably made the slides, it was called something different. But uh, um, I shortened the name, so it's easier to remember now. Um, and it's a tool for creating these reproducible software packages. OK, so I'm going to very briefly talk about the problem, because everybody here knows the problem. right? So, what are some of the barriers to reproducible research? Right? So there's all these human-related barriers that no automated tool can solve. Right? And this is a, for those who are curious, this is a bad picture from Google Images from like a parliament fight. Right? So this is representative of you know, all these human-related factors that get in the way of people reproducing each other's research. And there are you know, experts in this room who are tackling this problem. And you know, I am definitely not qualified to tackle these immense non-technical issues. Um, so you're not yep. saying that as scientists. <laughs> you can interpret however you like. These are politicians, I guess, literally speaking. So, um, so the, the issue that I want to tackle is the technical barrier to reproducible research. And I think this is where tools can obviously help. Because um, I'm, I'll, also, I'm also talking about research as in you know, computational research. Right? This is the, the barrier um, here. And the fundamental technical barrier, it seems like a fairly simple statement, but this is like the fundamental problem of why people can't reproduce each other's experiments, even besides all these other things, is this sentence right here. It's really hard to take research code that runs on your machine and get it to run on someone else's machine, even one with the same OS as yours. So everybody in this room you know, understands this. And there are websites everywhere that look like this. Right? So this is actually a fairly well-maintained, open-source, you know, researchy project. This is um, a mathematical graph library. It's a combination of Python and C++ code. And this has a website. It has documentation. It has support and everything. But in order to run this, you have to do all this stuff. Right? I mean, you got to have the right version of the compiler to compile the extension, the right version of these boost libraries, you know, SciPy, NumPy, all this extension and stuff. And, and each of these things has their own dependencies, right? So there's ways to deal with these, but you might have to end up manually compiling stuff. So I mean, if I want to run this, it's, not, it's possibly difficult or impossible. So um, this is everywhere on the internet, right? This is the current state of the art. So I'm going to summarize the current ways to distribute research code on one slide here. And this is, you know, my my one slide summary of the problem. So on the x-axis on this cartoon, I have the amount of pain you as the author must suffer right, when distributing your code. And on the y-axis, I have the amount of pain that your users have to suffer when they're trying to run your code. Right? So let's go down the list. Number one, zip up everything, throw it over the fence. Right? <laughs> so this is what I think a lot of people you know, end up doing, because it's the least amount of pain for you. Right? So if someone says, I want to reproduce your work, or can I work with your stuff, you're like, sure, I have some R script, Python scripts, here's my CSV files, here's my, you know, some data dumps. Zip it up, go ahead. You can do anything you want with it. You can reproduce my results. Right? Obviously, this is you know, near the infinity point of pain for users. Right? So I don't need to go into details. Um, a little bit down the curve here, we have creating a source distribution. Right? So if you uh, people who are a bit more conscientious, they kind of package up source code, write some make files, write some configure scripts, write some documentation, so that hopefully users can do a configure and make, or the equivalent in their own build system. So less pain for the users, obviously, more pain for you to do. Um, still, it's a fair amount of pain for users. They have to be sophisticated enough computationally to know how to do make files and have the right compiler versions and libraries and stuff. Compiling is not easy. Um, next thing is you can integrate with a package management system. So if you're on Linux or on your Mac or even on Windows, there are certain package management systems that contain libraries and other applications that you can um, plug into. So if you write a Debian package, you can say, I want this version of this library and that version of that library. You have to spend more work because you have to understand the package manager. But hopefully it's easier for your users. Right? They can, if they have sufficient package manager on their operating system, they can do an app get install, whatever, or RPM install, whatever. Um, the, the problem here, um, which you know, people who work package manager knows, is that as soon as there is one single version of one single dependency that's not in the package manager for that particular distribution of Linux or Mac or whatever that the person is trying to, the user is trying to run on, then this whole thing goes out the door, right? Because you know, I've definitely seen times when say, oh, why don't you just app get install this, and it says this version is not on my operating system or this version is not in this repository. So it's still not easy for users. So I'm going to keep on going, right? So this is. A popular approach, right? When people talk about reproducible research, virtual machines are a popular approach, and they're they're very good. I'll talk about this briefly later. Um, 
it's a, quite a lot of work for you to actually do this. And it's for a kind of a very simple um, reason that um, people who have not actually had to do this would not normally think about. It's that if you're a scientist and you already have your code, you have your computer, right? You have all this custom stuff installed in your computer over the past two years. You might have had your colleagues do it. You might have a staff programmer do it. You might have grad students do it. Your computer is set up perfectly to run your experiments, right? And if someone says, oh, I want to like, reproduce your experiments, can you package it up in a VM? So what do you have to do? You have to create a new VM image with the operating system version that matches yours. And then you have to reinstall all the stuff you had on your computer from those two or three years into the VM, which you probably don't know how to do, because you probably forgot all the stuff you had to install in order to do that. That, that, that's true. You, you could do that in certain type things too. Certain things. Sure, sure, sure. That's true. I mean, if you're on a platform to support set, there's, yeah. That's, that's another thing too, yeah. So, I mean, if you want to grab your whole disk image and, you know, put it in the VM, it's possible. With, I, I, with certain VMs, I think you can do that. Um, but let's just say it, it's still work to do. Right. And we should do all our own development in a VM. Yes. That's, I mean, that's what Bill's talk is going to be about, I think. <laughs> so we'll let him talk about that tomorrow. Um, but yeah, so assuming we have the current world where people are working in a physical machine, you have to do some work to get your stuff in a VM. It's easy for people to run, hopefully, right, because you can run on any x86 computer. But it's still not, you know, I would say there's still a little bit amount of pain involved just because they have to install the VM, they have to download it, it's big. It also doesn't run seamlessly on their machine because they have, you know, this, they can mount a shared drive if they want to interact with their files. It's, it's really running a different computer within their computer. Right? So, but what's the best thing for the user and the hardest for the author? Right? It's to create this robust one-click installer. So everybody who has to sell commercial software has to do this. Right? I mean, Microsoft, Adobe, Apple, everybody who is, wants you know, the masses to be able to use their software has to put so much time and effort and money into creating and testing installers. And this is actually something that's, you know, is, is extremely difficult to get right because just because everyone's operating system is a little different, right? And you really want to make it so the user double clicks, installs all your stuff, has it work. Even so, you know, people still have, you know, if you look at forums of Microsoft Office installation bugs, right? There's still tons of people who can't install Microsoft Office, not through any fault of their own, just because their system has some weird DLLs or weird issues. Um, but obviously, you know, this is the state of the art, right? So like nobody in science, I think, is going to go down all the way down to that curve, right? Just because it's so much trouble. I mean, there's all this non-technical incentive factors involved, you know, it keeps most people on this left end. So my bold claim during this talk is that the tool that I've been working on um, lies conveniently right here. All right. So, and hopefully in the next 20 minutes, I'll be able to convince you as to why it lies right there on that graph. And by the end of this talk, you should all be experts at using CD, I, I promise. You, you'll all know how to use it. So this is the instruction manual, one slide, instruction manual. So CD stands for Automatic Packaging of Code, Data, and Environment. So it packages your code, packages your data, and most importantly, packages the environmental dependencies around your code and data so someone else can run your stuff without having to go through all the installation. Um, so step one is to create the package. So currently, CD only works on Linux. So you create a package on your Linux computers. We're assuming you're, you're working on Linux. So you prepend any set of commands with the CD executable. And then CD will run those commands and automatically package up all the dependencies they need to run. So this command could be anything on your computer. It could be a GUI application you launch. It could be a make file. It could be a make script. It could be stuff written in any language or combination of languages. Right? Just all it cares about is just a command you're running on your computer. So the second thing is you have a package. Right? A package is simply a directory of files. It could be however big it needs to be in order to run everything. So Packages, by definition, are smaller than VMs because a VM contains whatever the package contains plus the rest of the OS kernel and the rest of the environment. So uh, they're, they're in the order of tens to hundreds of megabytes, whereas VMs are in you know, the gigabytes. So when you transfer your package, you can now execute the software from within the package on any modern Linux computer. So any Linux computer from the last few years, you should be able to run it um, by prepending those exact same commands with cd-exec. And then cd runs them natively on the machine without you having to install anything. So in this diagram cartoon I've shown, this target machine is like a cluster you have in your basement, right? In your basement lab, a cluster of Linux machines. This could also be Amazon EC2 in the cloud. This could be my laptop. This could be your colleague's desktop. It could be any Linux machine. So this is it right here, right? So there's CDE, transfer the package any way you like, and CDE exec. And I'm going to spend the rest of this um, talk just talking about CDE and CDE exec in details. Um, so how does CDE work, right? So this is a high cartoon level. What CD does is you launch a process, or you launch a process on your computer, and C, um, you launch CD to monitor it. And what CD does is it launches the program you want to monitor, and it uses um, the ptrace mechanism, 
which is a mechanism on Linux that lets one process spy on or monitor another one. And a, a debugger such as GDB uses ptrace on, on Linux. So that's what all debuggers use. So whenever the process needs to try to access any files, it has to make a system call into the kernel. So there are system calls like change directory, open, access, you know, read, write. There's all sorts of system calls for accessing files. And whenever CDE notices that the uh, program is trying to access a file through um, a system call, what it actually does, it copies that file into the package. This all happens at runtime while your program is running without um, any intervention by you. So here's the timeline diagram. Yes, I will point with this. Here's the timeline, right? So the program first issues an open system call or some kind of system call. Um, the kernel services it, opens the file from the file system, and then before returning the user, CD takes over control, copies that file into the package, which is just a subdirectory within the current directory, returns control back to the kernel, which returns control back to the user. So this all happens transparently. Okay, so now when you've um, packaged up everything into a directory, when you move it to the other machine, um, shown here, right, you move this to the other machine, and in order to execute the same uh, program on the other machine, what you do is you run CD exec and you run with the program name. And what that does is, again, CD exec launches the program um, from your package, attaches to it with ptrace again. And this time what it does is a bit more complicated. What it does is it, it not only monitors what files you're accessing, like you know, lib, libc, or foo, change directory, um, it actively rewrites those system calls. And this is the, you know, the, the, the key insight that makes CD exec work, is it actually, you know, the program, let's say, opens a file, the kernel goes and tries to open the file, but before the kernel can do anything, CD exec takes over execution and rewrites that argument of the open call. It rewrites the string that it's trying to access to um, point to a file name inside the package itself. And then when it goes back to the kernel, the kernel opens the file from the package because it doesn't know it's been fooled into opening something else. And then it returns back to the user, who doesn't even know that he's been, you know, the, the program has been fooled into opening a file in the package. And, and the critical part, the reason why this is necessary is because the files that the program is accessing might not exist on the machine you're moving it to. And even worse, they might exist, but they might be a different version. So we really have to use everything in that package um, in order for everything to be reproducible and work. So um, I'm going to now go through an example of creating a package with CD and then running with CD exec um, to, to make this more concrete. So, Let's say I have an experiment. It's in this directory, home, pg, experiments. These are kind of standard Linux paths. Um, I run my experiment. I'm like doing a weather prediction simulation thing. So I run, normally I run python predict weather.py. It does some crazy simulation on my desktop. Um, in order to create the package that will um, allow someone else to run this the same experiment, all I do, you notice, is I just put cd in front of that. Right? I'm just launching cd with the same command line. So we'll see what happens. So CD first launches, because it's the program I'm running. So the blue rectangles represent processes running on your machine. And then it launches Python and attaches to it with ptrace, which is the green um, dotted arrow. Now Python is going to start ac accessing files, right? And the files are denoted by the red rect uh, rectangles on the right. So the first file the Python process accesses is user bin Python, or the executable file for the code for itself, right? because it needs to actually run its own code. Um, another file I might access is libpython 2.6.so. So on Linux, SOs are shared libraries of code. Um, so it needs the, its own standard library. Um, and then it might access predictweather.py. I mean, it has to access sorry, predictweather.py because that's the script you're actually running. Great. So CD is monitoring all this in the background. right? And let's say now that Python is going, my Python script actually calls an R script, right? Because like, I have a colleague who did some modeling of weather in R, and I want to call their R code. So my Python script does a, you know, a OS system or some other thing that calls R code. Now R is being launched in a separate process, so Python launches it as a subprocess, and CD sees that and attaches onto that. Right? So now R accesses its own binary, accesses the standard library. I just made this up because I'm sure it's not actually called that. But, you know, we'll say the standard library of R code, right? As, as cartoon diagram. And then what else it acts, is it access? This, let's say that our R installation accesses uh, weathermod.so. So let's say weathermod.so is some custom R extension code that was done in Fortran or C++ that you know, one of my colleagues or you know, uh, my collaborators uh, did, and I had to compile and get it on my machine and tie it to my R installation. So this is not found in CRAN or in anywhere. Right? Nobody has this except for me. Right? But we just grab it because it's just running code. Right. And the final thing it loads is weather models.r. So that's my R script for doing weather modeling. That's great. So let's keep on going. So let's say R, like my weather models R code, needs some even more help. So it calls a weather sim program. 
And this is a program that you know, somebody from my lab wrote five years ago that man I managed to compile my machine and no one knows how to compile it now. But this is just some binary that was in C++ originally. Of course, CD attaches onto that and that access its own file. So we can just keep on going on, right? So you know, basically what happens with CD is it actually just hooks onto the process and monitors all that it does, and especially what other processes it spawns. So this is the, the really important part. So what does it do with all this information? Right, so it creates a CDE package, which is literally a subdirectory in my current directory. It's called CDE package. There's no magic there. And whatever files the program is trying to access, all it does is it just makes a copy into the CDE package inside this root folder I call CDE root. So notice how user bin Python goes into CDE root user bin Python. And this lib goes into there. So I, I'm replicating all the subdirectory structures, all the sim links. It's as though I'm kind of making a slice of the file system inside the package. You can think of it that way. Um, a more interesting case is predictweather.py, right? So I'm only accessing a, what is called a relative path, right? I mean, predictweather.py is just my current directory, but CD has to know that it actually means home PG experiment predictweather.py. It has to put it in the package in the exact same place where I was on my file system. Um, and then the same goes for everything else, right? So every file is being accessed, is being put in there. Okay, so now we have a package, right? And it's just subdirectory, no magic here. They're just files. You can zip it up, do whatever you want and you can transfer it to another machine. All right, so these other machines obviously have to be Linux as well because these files are all you know, Linux. You know, they're, they're, they're all compiled for Linux. Um, the machine can, be, um, can have a range of ages actually. It can, you, well, I'll show you later how you can actually, there's about a five year portability window. So there's a question in the back earlier about archiving and I'll, I'll get to that later. But uh, just out of the box, we have about a five year window where you can move uh, things to, which is a, actually a far greater window than if you don't use this tool. Um, Linux application is actually not very, very portable across distributions. Um, so we transfer to target machine. We want to run it now, right? So to run it, what we have to do first is a kind of change into the directory within the package where my experiment originally resided. So the path looks kind of long, but it's, it needs to be there, right? So we have to go in the package, go in my home PG experiment folder, because that's where my experiment was, right? That's where my script was and all my data files were. Um, so when I see it into that directory, it's as though I had gone to my machine and seen the experiment. And then to basically to reproduce my run, right? All I have to do to reproduce my run is um, I run my original command line um, with cd-exec in front of it. And what that does is cd-exec launches, and then when and it launches Python, right? And when Python now tries to access any files, it does that cd-exec will rewrite all their system calls at runtime as they're trying to access it to trick Python into opening the files in the package. So you notice how even if I have a version of Python on my computer, um, even if this user has a version of Python on her computer, it will not use that version of Python. It will use the Python in the package, which is very important. Um, and then when Python launches, say, R, you know, CD exec launches some of that, and it tricks R into using the version of R in the package, which includes my custom libraries. Right? So, and then R launches this other thing. So you know, in short, what happens here is that CD exec has imposed this user level sandbox on the, on, on the um, application so that it really runs everything in the package. And, um, I can talk about this a bit offline, um, but that you, the sandbox is actually very customizable. So if you, for example, if you want to run this experiment using data from your own computer, you can set some policies whereby it actually um, doesn't redirect certain paths. And there's actually some semi-automated support for that, but I'll go into that after this talk. Okay, so now it's time for a sort of live demo. So because live demos are so prone to failure, I actually just took a live demo I recorded earlier, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna replay the live demo and narrate. Um, so what, what I'm doing here is actually um, in this quote unquote demo, I have an Ubuntu 10.10 machine, which is a very modern Linux machine, right? So it's from October 2010. Um, and that has like a purple terminal background, you'll see. Um, I created a, like a sample Python workflow where it's like, you know, I, I can do some data analysis and do some graphing. And I'm able to, I'll show you how I'm able to take that, create a CD package just with one line, just running CDE and then move that package back in time about five years to an older uh, Linux distribution with this black terminal background and have it run out of the box, no installation, um, with, with just do the exact run with no installation. Um, and more than that, it's not really just a reproducibility thing. I can show you how you can actually adjust the script and adjust the parameters. So you can actually, as a you know, reviewer, as a colleague, you can actually run different, similar but different runs um, because it's just really running the version of Python that I have. Right. And, and for, for people who've actually tried to do this, you'll see that this is actually a, 
a non-trivial feat because moving something back in time is very hard because the operating system five years ago doesn't know what advances have been made in operating systems in the next five years. It can't predict the future. So doing this is a lot harder than doing it the other way. Right? If you do the other way, uh, operating systems are designed for backwards compatibility to a certain extent. Okay, so this demo is four minutes long. I'm just going to narrate. It's, it goes a little bit fast because this is what I have on the website as a sales pitch. So it's a little bit fast. So I'm going to talk like a carny or an auctioneer or whatever. So. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. Okay. <laughs> um, oh no, I missed it. Okay. <laughs> Even the live demo failed. Did that work? Wow, that's weird. Ah, here we go. Good. Okay, so the purple, oh gosh, it's really dark. Yeah, maybe turn the lights down. So the purple background here is, you got it? Yeah, so it's going to be super dark, but we'll, hopefully we'll be able to see. <laughs> Go for that. Wow, it's quite theatrical. So okay, what, that's a great question. Um, the CD has the minimal possible dependencies on Linux, which is just a version of libc. Actually, you can take the CD binder and run it on really old Linux machines. Okay. It, I, I designed it the minimal possible set of things possible. It's a great question. Um, okay, so let's try that. So th this background is my my own computer. It's a 2010 computer, so you'll recognize it. Um, and it says Ubuntu on top, so maybe that's how you can tell instead of color. This one with the blue bar is an old 2006 computer. Okay, so now I can have, I have this London data set, which is some like weather data I want to mine. I just made this up, right? And then I can run Python to plot this data, and it launches some GUI. Okay, great. So that I can interact with it, it's great, and my colleague wants to play with this GUI, interact with it, and uh, reproduce my experiment and build off of it. So, since there's only two files, right, there's only a uh, data set and a um, Python script, I could just give that to her, right? I mean, that seems so easy, right? I mean, everybody has Python, right? So I copy this to her. She has Python, right? Everyone has Python. So why can't she just run the same thing? I mean, everybody knows the answer to this by now, right? Because something's missing, right? And if she had installed NumPy, you'll find that SciPy is missing, you'll find Matplotlib is missing, you'll find Matplotlib is impossible to install on this machine. Um, so, it's really hard, right? So there's actually no way she can install that file on this machine without going through a lot of hassle, because it's an older machine. Um, okay, so um, how can we use CD to alleviate this pain? All right, so let's switch back to our other machine, and then we're just gonna run CDE with the same command line, you notice, and that will execute the program, and while it's executing, it takes a little longer because it's actually copying all the files in the package, it pops up, you can interact with it like you used to, it's the same program. And now it creates a package. You can see it into it and you can uh, look in the contents. So there's a lot of files in there. So there's shared libraries, there's uh, fonts, there's config files, there's basically everything you need in order to run that version of Python with all the libraries on the other machine. Right? There's a lot, a lot of stuff. Right? And, and there's no way you want to grab all this by hand. Right? There's so much stuff. So it's just a package, we can just tar it up, copy it to my colleague's machine. So here we're back on the old 2006 machine. Um, we have the CD package, we untarred it, and she can CD into the package directory. Um, there's a long path here because this is where my experiment is, right? So that's where my london.dat file, my scientific data Python script is. So um, the, P the working directory is inside the package, inside of home Philip Guo Python science demo. And recall that on my original computer, my experiment is in home Philip Guo Python science demo, right? And recall that I run Python on the script on the data set to run my original run. Okay, so why can't she do the same thing, just as a reminder? Because her Python doesn't have the right version, right? Um, and doesn't have the plugin. But instead, there's this python.cde that I put in there. And python.cde is simply a wrapper around CDE exec. So this will actually run CDE dash, it'll actually find CDE exec in the package and run CDE exec Python. So watch, when I run this, it'll actually run the Python within my package, which has all of the plugins installed, and it will actually pop up the GUI on her machine from 2006, and she can just interact with it. So she has basically reproduced my experiment without installing anything on a machine that was so old you couldn't even install this. Um, but of course, this is not just a reproduction run. I mean, this is not just like a thing I just draw a pretty figure. She can also change my script, as long as obviously she's not importing some crazy other module that I'd never imported, she can change the script a lot. So let's say she doesn't like the zoom factor, right? So negative 0.5 to 1.5 is not a good zoom. Let's say we want the zoom to be between zero and one, all right? So if we change that code, we can save it and then we can rerun it. And this is just rerunning the same Python on the new code. And if you look at the lower half of the diagram, the axis is between zero and one now. 
Um, and if you look at my other one, the axis between negative 0.5 and 1.5, right? So this is, you know, the important thing here is to show that you're not only reproducing the experiment. I mean, as many of you know, it's important to be able to adjust parameters. And, you know, in the simulation, I use this visual example, but you can just as well, you know, change the alpha value or change some, you know, sampling rate or something, as long as obviously you're not changing the experiment, right? I mean, if you're trying to import some other crazy module that I didn't originally import, then you're out of luck. I mean, you're not even reproducing the experiment. Though. You're just doing a new experiment. Okay, so in sum, um, we've been able to get CD packages to run across all these different distributions and more within the past about five years. And the, the limit for those who are curious is when the kernel to binary um, ABI changes. So when, you know, kernels that are older than 2006, they expect different things of system calls. And, you know, when that layer, you know, it breaks, there's no way you can get around that, except if you use a VM, um, which will really give you more of the portability. Um, so it doesn't really matter what distribution you're on. Um, we tried many more of this. Um, because in the end, you know, Linux is Linux, right? I mean, the distributions really only differ in terms of what version of the stuff they have. So I'm going to um, finish up the last part of my talk talking about some benefits, some limitations, and finally kind of some opportunities for collaboration and integration. Um, and I'd be happy to take questions. So three main benefits. Number one is it, creating a CD package is as easy as running your original experiment. And I think, you know, for me, the design of this tool um, really center around this first promise right here, is that if you can run your experiment, which I hope you're able to, you can create a package that allows everyone else to run. So there is no user interface, right? The user interface is as simple as running your original experiment. There's no additional steps involved. Um, on a related note, number two is that it works with existing languages and tools. So um, there, there, you know, we've heard some talks such as VizTrails, and we're going to you know, hopefully hear more in the next uh, day about, you know, kind of the future forward-looking things. Like, you know, if we could get, you know, we could make every scientist use VizTrails or use uh, a more robust tool, then, then a lot of these provenance issues and a lot of these issues with producibility will be so much easier, right? Because if everyone has a really good unified framework with tracking all the stuff, then, you know, reproducibility, the technical barriers to reproduce at least, will be largely overcome. But, I mean, until we get there, I think that we have to operate under the assumption that everyone is using their own um, ad hoc collection of tools, right? You know, somebody might be liking R, some people like Ruby, some people like C++, some people like using GUIs, right? Some people like using Octave, MATLAB. Um, but CD works with any of those, right? As long as you're on Linux, of course. I mean, the, the OS is the base. And the last benefit is that executing a CD package requires no installation, no setup, and it doesn't require root permissions. And this one is huge also because uh, there's not a risk in running your package, right? If, if you want to get someone else to rerun your code and you tell them you have to install all the stuff on your machine, um, they might be reluctant to install all the stuff because especially if people on Linux know that if you're installing packages, you might break other things. And this actually happens in all OSs. Right. Yep. Uh, when you created a package, uh, it's a copy of CD itself, right? Yes, it copies the CD exec itself. That's right. It copies the CD exec itself into the package. So you don't actually need anything else. That's a good question. Um, I'm just having this Machiavellian thought right now. So suppose I wrote something in Mac. <laughs> and I wanted to run it through on my Linux machine. Right. So you'll CD, I make a CDE exec, which then copies MATLAB and reflects in my LM license, mm -hmm. and all of the things that I need to run that map on my machine yep. into your directory, which I then give to uh, Jared over here, who then- Who will purchase the MATLAB license himself. Right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? Um, so I think the question or comment is about piracy, right? And this is a good way to pirate software. Um, actually, I, tr yeah. As an experiment, I tried doing that on MATLAB. MATLAB actually uses a licensed server, so you actually, this actually doesn't work unless you do a, a, some more hackery. But the straightforward application you try to pack for MATLAB, it will fail because um, you're on a different MAC address or a different whatever. It has, some, yeah, it has something to do with the physical configuration. Yeah, it has something to do with the physical configuration. So they're smart. I mean, basically, my, my whole thing with piracy is it's as easy to pirate using this as in other means, right? This is, there's no magic here, just making it, you know, it's making it all automated. So there's, you know, People have to do their own copy protection if you don't want to pirate. Same thing with licensing. Another thing, I mean, if you distribute, I mean, this is the non-technical part, parliament fighting part, right? Like, if you're redistributing stuff without people's proper license permission, that's, you know, this is not the tool's purview, right? I mean, like, I don't, you know, the tool has no, you know, opinions on that. And you have to really clear everything before you distribute. So that's another disclaimer. Um, but yeah, in terms of the technical parts, you know, you know, executing requires nothing. I mean, it requires less than you doing an installation itself. So, limitations, right? So. There's four main ones. The, the first, you know, the, the kind of big one that people often think about is that the packages are incomplete, right? Because it, they're only as complete as what you run, which makes sense because it's monitoring what you run. We do some tricks, some heuristics with trying to grab some more additional things, but there's not a general automated solution to that, right? I mean, you really can't 
you know, analyze everything and grab everything you need um, for the general case. Right? You can special case to different languages, like in Python, you can see the imports and stuff. But as a general solution, there is none. Um, this actually not, isn't that much of a problem for reproducibility, in my view, because the whole point of reproducibility is that you're reproducing the run that you did and also trying to modify it in some small amounts to adjust parameters or adjust things. This incompleteness is more of a problem for general distribution. Um, the second thing is that the execution is a bit slower because you go through this extra overhead of tracing and monitoring the system calls and intercepting them. In practice, I've never seen anything above like a 30% slowdown. So um, it could be actually very small um, to something noticeable. But of course, that's the trade-off you make for the convenience factor, right? And there's no install, no dependencies or anything. But I think that this is such a big deal because the way that I think is you're gonna run your experiments until you get something that it's stable. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're gonna distribute. So you run this once. Um, you run it once, but the person who's running it out on their machine, yeah, this is the running, not just packaging. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question, Magellan. So the question or comment, I guess, was both packaging and running it is going to be slower. Right? So it's not just the packaging, because you're packaging once, but uh, people might be running it a lot of times. So it will be a bit slower. Um, the third one is, um, I think the question over here was that it can't emulate custom hardware. I mean, it doesn't do any magic, right? So like if, you, if you're plugged into some custom crazy hardware thing, People aren't going to reproduce your experiment anyways on their machine unless they have the same crazy hardware. Right? So this is only for pure software. Um, and the last one is um, it only goes from x86 to x86. So it supports both 32 and 64-bit, but really is you know x86 thing, which is not bad because most people are in x86. The bigger one is that it's only kind of for modern versions of Linux. Um, and it's just because we're grabbing the binaries. So um, it turns out the Linux 2.6, the subset of Linux 2.6 we support, is re we really practically have about a five-year time bound on this, um, and this is just out of the box. Um, I've heard of special cases where people can set flags or whatever to get this to go a little bit more, but you know, it's, it's not really officially supported, um, which segues into my next point of how do we get this to be more portable, right? So the, the first thing that comes to mind, right, is to put it in a VM, right? So kind of going back to my, one of my early slides is if you create the package of CD and you just stuff it in a fresh Linux VM, it provides greater portability than CD by itself because now people on Mac and on Windows can run it. Of course, you still have to start on Linux, but you know, your colleagues on any machine can run it. Um, and it enables longer term archiving, right? So you, know, you can really think of CD in this regard as a bootstrapping step for getting, your, getting a minimal VM image uh, for archiving. So you know, the hope is in five years or in 10 years, you can still run this um, as long as x86 hasn't changed enough um, or as long as x86 has changed in a backwards compatible way. Um, so, and this kind of has the advantage of we're only extracting exactly what you need for experiments. So you don't, you know, grab your whole hard drive and throw it in your VM with all your personal data files. Um, so the second way to integrate is something like EC2 or Amazon Web Services. So, um, so EC2 is a service that allows you to pay for um, instances of Linux um, VMs on, in the cloud. So one thing you can imagine is deploying your stuff to the cloud instantly. So I have some stuff on my laptop. I have a bunch of custom software I want to run. I want to deploy it to the cloud. You create a package and you just put it on the cloud and it runs without installation. You don't have to customize your VM image at all. And you can imagine doing this for parallelism, right? So if I have some application that needs to crunch a bunch of data, I just launch a thousand instances on the cloud and crunch some public data set. And it's actually very fast and easy. Um, in terms of the, you know, people have talked about reviews. I mean, one, one cool vision um, here would be it enables reviewers to, let's say, SSH or VNC into this public URL you provide and actually run your experiments without installing anything on their machine. They don't have to be running anything. You can imagine in your paper or on your website, you just say, here's my URL, go do it, and there's actually a web interface for them to play with your experiments because it's all on Amazon. Um, I think that's actually pretty promising. Um, the, the last one is um, th that I have here is something like CD and Git or Subversion. Right? So you can easily collaborate with people by just checking in all your dependencies into the repository. Of course, it's bigger, but now if someone wants to pull or to download your repository, they can actually get started with coding and collaborating right away. They can, you, know, you can imagine you know, if you're working all on a paper together and you put all the dependencies in the repository, they can be running experiments, building off of it, then check in the same repository, and everyone's on the same page. And when you like, you know, say make and, hit and, and, and run and uh, generate your paper, everybody will be able to say make and generate the paper because that make will run the exact same, like, R scripts and all these other analyses that generate the exact same paper. And you can either, you can use this to collaborate or you can, you can kind of combine it with that, right? So you can just say, if reviewers or colleagues want to pull my public JIT repository, I can, they can just download and, and collaborate. And you know, the, the, the last thing on here is, you know, let's, let's really talk about how we can integrate CDE with some of the tools that you all have built. Because I think, it's, um, it's, I think it can really serve as a layer 
below a lot of other tools. Um, currently, it only is on Linux, but I think um, there's big possibilities there. So to sum up, I'm going to go back to this early slide, right? So this is the, the problem here that we wanted to, to solve. And I think that um, you know, my, my sales pitch for CD is that it, you know, for certain types of applications, um, for a large class of Linux applications, it is actually delivered on this very simple promise, right? So the simple promise is in, if you can run a set of Linux commands, you know, on your Linux machine, then CD allows anyone to easily rerun those same commands on their Linux machine. Right? And of course, with a VM, they can run it somewhere else. And they can not only rerun them, they can adjust and such. But that doesn't all fit in one sentence. So this is a simple promise that, you know, in an ideal world, this should not be a problem. But of course, in the real world, this is a problem. Second one is it's legacy friendly, right? So scientists can work in their favorite program languages or GUI tools. We're not going to, um, you know, they don't have to learn anything new. I mean, they can get benefit from it right away. I mean, you know, all of you, if you're actually working experiments, you all now know how to use this, right? You just put CD in front of your, your commands. Um, Implementation-wise, it's been uh, fairly battle-hardened. I mean, there's been thousands of downloads. There's been a lot of, you know, hundreds of these subtle bug fixes and able to just work out of the box. And I would love to receive more bug reports. I've, you know, I, I've seen lots of examples that people give me of, oh, this breaks in this corner case. I've actually spent a lot of time in the last few months actually fixing a lot of these subtle bugs to enable it to deliver the simple promise. I mean, the thing with CD that I, I really am um, excited about is it's a very simple tool, right? I mean, it looks like you're just running stuff and it's, it just works, right? But of course, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that actually make it so that it works with no configuration or setup. And your question there of dependencies is that CD itself has the minimal set of dependencies of any Linux application I know. Um, so you can actually just download the binary on the website and it will run on your Linux machine within the last five years. Um, and the last thing I really want to end on this point is that, um, you know, I, I give, you know, I, I, you know, whenever I give, you know, kind of traditional conference talks about research, it's always the same kind of schema that everyone has, right? It's like, I've, you know, we've done some research and we've written a paper and we've really competed with other people and we got this paper accepted and we're going to show off our work and show you why it's cool and there's like graphs. But, you know, my purpose in talking here is actually very different, right? It's, it's really to um, try to strike us some, some like collaboration opportunities to really just talk to people about how we can integrate these tools, right? So, you know, it, it, I, th I really think that the simplicity of CD allows it to serve as a layer below other more sophisticated tools that you all have built. And um, I really like to discuss um, integration opportunities seriously throughout these next day. Um, so um, it's all my slides. I'd be happy to take questions. Um, yeah. Is there any special issues you have to deal with for programs that deal with databases or web servers? Or another thing I was thinking about is some like, non c random generated number generators. non c random number generators. So I mean, obviously, if you have a random, I mean, I'm not going to capture all the random seed stuff. So I mean, you have to have dev random on your other Linux computer. I don't capture any device drivers, right? So. So I think, you know, you're obviously, with anything random, unless you um, seed it, you're going to, the results are going to look different. Um, but you could seed it, I guess. And, and the question about uh, databases and web servers. So databases are just files, and they're just, um, I, actually, databases could, so SQLite's easy, right? SQLite is just a file. Um, MySQL has, starts up its own server process. So the way to deal with that, oh, remote database and stuff. Um, I don't package up the remote servers. <laughs> Uh, I actually don't really know anything about MySQL, but I think you know, my vision of my anything, my vision of anything besides SQLite is that it's some separate daemon that runs. So that if you want to capture your MySQL stuff, you have to capture that daemon as well. Um, so the question about remote stuff, I think, as long as that other computer can connect to the internet to your remote server, I think it should work. Is that the question? Or well, I was just, I, mean, I was just wondering if like, you set up some sort of like fake boss that you can use like program. Uh, execute some uh, request to a remote server, mm -hmm. and you can intercept that conceivably, rewrite it, and then just report whatever the response is for it, and replay that just back. Um, that, that's, a great, that's, that's a good suggestion. Um, that, I think that kind of goes more along. There's, like, there's related work on what they call record replay systems that really aim to deterministically like, replay what you did before. And I think for those systems, they want to record the network interaction. But for me, I, you know, I don't want this to be a replay tool. I want this to be a you just run software tool. So I don't record any network activity. I mean. I, I make it so that when you bring it to the other machine, the package can access the network normally. So if you have stuff on a public network, you can use it. So have you, have you done that experiment with this? Oh, sorry. Have you yeah. done that experiment with this? Have you actually kicked off the process and let CD track the entire database? Um, I have not done it with the database. Um, I've done it with a, uh, one of our colleagues. They have a, like, they have a, a daemon that does um, constraint solving, like um, SAT solving. So I just ran a SAT solving daemon, and then I ran it 
So yeah, but I haven't tried it with the database. If I could, the next day. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about server process on databases. Um, can you create a package with multiple commands? Yeah. So in other words, it'll just keep adding to the package that you've created so far. Yep. And it's as easy as probably what you're thinking. You just run it multiple it's times. Yeah. I mean, as long as you're in the same directory, it just keeps on appending. Yeah. So if you run a process like IPython, it opens up the interactive shell, mm -hmm. it would capture that too? It would capture, it wouldn't capture your, I mean, yeah, it would capture everything you're doing in the shell. I mean, it wouldn't capture all your commands, but if I, inside IPython you say import whatever, it will capture those. Exactly. Yeah, and so then when you run them again, it would open up an IPython it would open shell, up a Python. and it would have all those modules yep. if you wanted to import them and use them. Yep, exactly. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, and can anytime support 64 bit? Yes, it, it does support 64 bit. Oh, it's x86 64 also. Oh, so, okay. uh, briefly, on a 64 bit, okay, there's all these permutations. Okay. On a 32 bit machine, you have a 32 bit CD process. It can monitor 32 bit CD processes. Sorry, it can monitor a 32 bit host machine as running all 32 bit software, right? You can take that package and run it on a 32 or a 64 bit machine. That makes sense? On a 64 bit machine, you can, you can run 64-bit or 32-bit processes, package up a mix of those, and run it on another 64-bit machine. Yeah, so it works to the extent of the most things can work on x86. So the second part of the question is, can you support OS X? Uh, that's a great question. Um, in terms of um, implementation, I've, I've seen that there are, I think there, there are maybe technical issues on OS X because they've kind of, their system call interface is they've you know, disabled a lot of functionality um, due to reasons I probably don't want to speculate about. But they, it's a lot more impoverished of the interface, so it may be harder to do it in the same way. Um, and also, as a practical issue, I don't have any money. <laughs> I mean, like I'm, I'm trying to graduate, and you know, creating another implementation for another year will not help me graduate. <laughs> to practically answer the question. Um, is there other questions? One more yeah. comment, maybe. So it seems, it seems to me that you got the potential to package managers. And so if you had, you know, if all software was distributed this way, right, all you need for is a for is a D duper on the other side to sort of, you know, it, it, you know, you don't you want 20 versions of the exact same sure, right. machine. You've got somebody to sort of account for that. This would actually be a superior way to distribute software, I think, than trying to worry about complex interdependencies and version upgrades right. and so on. You'd be guaranteed that whatever you download actually would work the way the, you know, the last time it worked on the right, other right. side. Have you thought, thought about sort of competing with you could be my marketing manager on that. Um, that's, a, that's a great point. People who love package managers hate my talk. Um, and it's because the, I think the most legitimate um, criticism they have of this is security. Right? So like, the whole reason for having dynamic libraries is that when you, create a, when you upgrade your system with a new version that's more secure, you, all your applications who link to that actually get it. So with, with this, you're kind of freezing. Sure, sure. Yeah. So security is one concern because you don't get any upgrades. But um, yeah, I agree with the deduping thing. You could you could possibly replace faction manager. I have not advertised in this way because, so when this thing got on Slashdot a few months ago, there were lots of angry people ranting about this exact same issue. Of, <laughs> like, we love package managers, we hate this. But yes, great comment. So are there other security issues, I'm sorry. Double. But are there other security issues that people would have to worry about if someone, if someone sends me uh, something that's been packaged with CD, should I be concerned about running it? That's a great question. I think. The answer is you should be as concerned about running it as any other software you're running on your machine because it's not uh, because you're running it as a regular user. So any software running on your machine has the same security risk as this. So if someone wanted to be evil and have inside the CD package have a, you know have the program be remove your whole hard drive, that's just as bad as someone you downloading someone's program and they remove your whole hard drive. So it's just as insecure or secure as regular software. Roger. I just want to, I mean, one of the key things I think. It's worth pointing out is that it's really you're reproducing the environment. Right. I mean, if I launch a GUI and punch a bunch of buttons, mm -hmm. and then I give someone the CD package, that work is not reproducible, right? Because they don't know what buttons I punched. Sure, right? sure. So, and so there's a, there's a key element here which is reproducing the environment, but I think there's, a, there's also other key elements that come with, that are coming to play with reproducible research. Yep. Yeah, so. that, that's a, that's a really good point. That's, I think the hope is this. Bottom layer thing. I mean, I envision this as the bottom layer on top of things, such as provenance, for example. Right, there's yeah. a huge problem with these yep. all tear, I think, yeah. So. Oh, thanks for coming. We should probably uh, wrap it up then. Oh. Thanks.